Hello and welcome back to Power Sessions with Natasha. Today we are continuing our series Africa's Queens and today we are going all the way to West Africa in Ghana. Our queen that we're going to be talking about today is Ya Asantewa. Ya Asantewa was born in 1840 in the heart of the Asante Empire in what is now present-day central Ghana. She had an older brother who would later become Ejusuhene, a divisional chiefdom under the king of the Asante Empire. Her family chiefdom was among the kingmakers and top aristocrats of the Asante Empire. At the time of her childhood, the British and French were carving out Africa for themselves in now the infamous Berlin Conference of 1880. The British got what they greedily called the Gold Coast or modern-day Ghana. The British, after Berlin, started their campaign to take over Ghana, including the gold-rich Asante Empire to which Ya Asantewa belonged to. She was a successful farmer, a mother, she was an intellectual, a politician, human rights activist, queen and a leader. Ya Asantewa became famous for leading the Ashanti rebellion against British colonialism to defend the golden stool. Asantewa was appointed queen mother by her brother, Nana Ekwesi Afrene or Pese. Ekwesi died from the Asante civil war between 1883 to 1818. After his death, Ya Asantewa, being very influential as queen mother, became one of the most powerful elders of the Asante kingdom. As queen mother, she had the power and the right to choose who would become king and she nominated her grandson as ruler of Ejusu. In the continued battles between the British and the Asante people, the British started to strategically capture chiefs and kings and important people of the empire and transporting them as prisoners and exiling them to the island of the Seychelles. In 1896, her grandson, as well as the king of the Asante, Prempe I, were exiled to Seychelles by the British. This was Britain's way of dealing with African kings and was a way of leaving the people deprived of leadership. Sending a king to exile in such times was often followed by looting of their land. With the Asante people, this allowed the British to loot their raw gold ornaments and artifacts of the empire. Having exiled the king and his government, the British now thought they were in charge and that they would be no more rebellion, much less any rebellion instigated by a woman. With British patriarchy ways and misogyny, they couldn't imagine a woman instigating a war. Even their queens are, m are just mere figureheads, stripped of any political power. So, either by ignorance or stupidity, the British governor in the Gold Coast, who was called Frederick Hodgson demanded that he be allowed to sit on the golden stool. The golden stool was the most important artifact of the Asante kingdom. The golden stool, its full title is Sika Dwia Kofi, has been the symbol of power in Ashanti kingdom since the 17th century. According to oral tradition, Okonfor Anochi, a high priest and one of the two founders of the Ashanti Confederacy, conjured the golden stool, decorated with golden bells, and caused it to descend from the sky, where it landed at the feet of Oseyu Tutu I, the first Asante Ehen king of Ashanti. Beginning with Oseyu Tutu, the Ashanti have believed that the golden stool houses the soul of the Ashanti nation. The stool is made of gold, stands 18 inches high, 24 inches long and 12 inches wide. It was never allowed to touch the ground and was considered so sacred that no one was allowed to sit on it. Each new Ashanti king is lowered and raised over the golden stool without touching it. No one could be considered a legitimate ruler without the golden stool, 
which usually occupied its own throne next to the Asantiheni. The Ashanti maintained the golden stool as their most prized possession. Before they went to war, their war chiefs consulted it. As time progressed and as the Ashanti scored more victories over their rivals, turning their kingdom into an empire, the golden stool became even more revered. However, this foolish, foolish British civil servant believed that as a nominal leader, because they had somehow exiled the leaders of the Ashanti, he was now the leader of the Gold Coast and therefore the Asante Empire. He somehow had the right to sit on the most important artifact of the Asante people. The stool holds not just a ceremonial place in the hearts of every Asante, but a spiritual one. He was actually quoted foolishly saying these words. He said to the Asante people in front of them, he said, where is the gold stool? Why am I not sitting on the gold stool at this moment? I am the representative of the paramount power. Why have you relegated me to this chair? Why did you not take the opportunity of my coming to Kumasi to bring the golden stool for me to sit upon? However, you may be quite sure that the government has not received the golden stool at his hands. It will rule over you with the same impartiality and fairness as if you had produced it. These uncultured British who were in the habit and looting and stealing African artifacts and sending them to Britain did not understand the enormity of what they were asking. He did this because he thought they had decimated the power of the kingdom by kidnapping the king and his government. But he was about to realize that African warriors do not only come in men because when push comes to shove, African women will step up to the plate. African women have had very active roles during wars. When the men have fallen, African women have historically picked up arms and gone to war. To the British who were used to gender segregation and the lack of power of their women, they didn't see this coming. The golden stool had been hidden when the king had been kidnapped. Hodgson then deployed a force to embark on a search for the golden stool which had been hidden away. So when he gave his little speech in front of the Asante people, none of the male governors spoke up. However, Ya Asantewa, as part of the royal family, was in charge and she summoned whoever was left of the Ashanti kingdom and the government to a secret meeting to devise means through which they would protect their sacred stool and secure the return of their exiled king. Ya Asantewa was highly disgusted at the behavior of her male counterparts and she went on to say to them, how can a proud and brave people like the Ashanti sit back and look while white men take away their king and chiefs and humiliate them with the demand for the golden stool? The golden stool only means money to the white man. They have searched and dug for it everywhere. I shall not pay one penny to the governor. If you, the chiefs of Sashanti, are going to behave like cowards and not fight, you should exchange your loincloths for my undergarments. During this meeting, Ya Asantewa took a gun, fired the gun in front of the chiefs to formalize her challenge to them about being brave. She was made chief commander of the entire Asante army. She wasn't the only woman who supported this movement. She had an ally in her friend and fellow warrior, Queen Mother Nana Afrenewa. Ya Asantewa was able to assemble an army of 5,000 people and under her command, they instigated the Ashanti British War of the Golden Stool. In front of her troops, assembled all her warriors, Before going into war, she gave this very moving speech. She said, brave men of Ashanti, we are now faced with a serious confrontation. 
by the governor's extremely provocative quest for the golden stool, which is the religious symbol of unity for the Ashanti nation. Not quite long ago, the white man came and unilaterally occupied our God-given land and by force of arms has declared Ashanti Kingdom a British protectorate. We should also not forget that during the reign of King Karikari, the aggressors waged a senseless war on us, destroyed the seat of our Ashanti monarch and burnt our palace after looting all the treasures bequeathed to us by our forefathers, taking our brave men for a ride. The governor has exiled our prominent chiefs and kings without you men raising a finger. Today, he has come back again to demand the golden stool. Gallant youth and men of our fatherland, shall we sit down and be dehumanized all the time by these rogues? We should rise and defend our heritage. It is better to perish than to look on sheepishly while the white man whose sole business in our country is to steal, jail, and destroy threaten us to rob us of our golden stool arise men and defend the golden stool from being captured by foreigners it is more honorable to perish in defense of the golden stool than to remain in perpetual slavery i am prepared and ready to lead you to war against the white man Ya Asantewa became the only woman in Ashanti history to ever lead an army. When the war began, Hodgen's deputy and his force were ambushed, killing a number of them, and the survivors were only lucky to have escaped due to a sudden rainstorm. Bearing the news of the attack, the soldiers retreated to Kwamasi, where British forces were located. The British officers were immediately fortified with high walls, firing firing and 500 over 500 armed men the ashantis were not prepared to storm the fort so they settled into a long siege they were ready for the long haul for the long battle an assault was launched on april 29 but it ended up un unsuccessful ya asantewa as a warrior used powerful psychological strategies against the british she used the Ashanti talking drums to convey to the British several messages during warfare. One beat meant prepare to die. Three beats on the drums meant cut the head off. And four beats on the drums meant the head is off. This was said to have caused much fear among the British. Still, the Ashantis did not back down and they continued to snipe at the British, blocking all roads leading to the town intercepting the British food supply and destroying their telegraph wires. This will trap the British in for a while, cutting them off from their supply lines and make, making communication very tough. An outbreak of disease only added to the problems of the British. In June 23rd, a rescue party arrived, aiding in breaking the siege making escape possible for Hodgson, his wife, and several other healthier men. They were still pursued by the Ashanti, a braid warriors who wounded and killed many of them. However, in the following year, the British would make a strike back and would ultimately conquer the Ashanti lands. Several chiefs of the Ashanti were arrested, including Ya Asantewa. They were eventually banished to the Seychelles for a 25-year period. Within this period in exile, many of them died. Ya Asantewa died in exile in 1921. However, in 1924, the exiled king, Prempe the first was allowed to return to his people. While there is no certainty regarding the amount of Ashanti casualties, the war of the Golden Stool cost the British about 1,000 casualties. The Ashanti Empire was ultimately conquered by the British and made a protectorate of the British crown. The people of the Ashanti, however, 
claimed victory in this historic event as they had protected their sacred stool from the British, keeping it from being desecrated by foreigners. The golden stool continues to be used in rituals, crowning the Asante Heni. The golden stool remains a cherished symbol of the former Ashanti Empire. King Prehempe the first returned from exile and would give Asantewa a proper burial as custom for the Ashanti people and he fulfilled this. On March 6, 1957, Ghana declared its independence and became the first sub-Saharan African to do so. Ya Asantewa's name will forever be etched deep in the history of the Ashanti and one of Africa's greatest female leaders of her people and of the great continent. I urge you again to go and learn about this amazing queen. We come from kings and queens. Let's learn our history. Let's learn who we are. Thank you for listening and I'll see you on the next episode.